Uh, he's the curator of the museum. Uh, thank you. He's the curator of the museum. And uh, they should have commissioned this early this month. But uh, I understand that uh, the government sent some uh, instructions to them that they should hold on until uh, 1st July. 1st July, Ghana had its republic on 1st July. So it will be commissioned on 1st July. Uh, yeah. So when he said this, I said, well, we are here. We can go back. Definitely, we need to hear from him. So I invite him to come and then at least share something with us about Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. All of us have heard of Kwame Nkrumah. What did he do for Ghana, for Africa, and the world? So uh, he will tell us. And then at the end of it, we'll ask some questions. Then we'll continue from there. Madasi. OK, so my English name is Edward. But I prefer to be called Kofi, K-O-F-I, because I was born on a Friday as a male. So you get to learn that in Ghana, especially in the South, the day of the week on which you are born is like your soul or spiritual name. So we all bear those names yeah. too. So this is the memorial for our first president called Osajefo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And he was also called Kwame because he was born on a Saturday as a male. And the reason why we have the monument built on this particular location is that during our colonial period, this was actually the grounds the British or the English played polo. So it used to be a polo field and meant for only the British. Natives like us were not allowed to come here. So when it was due for us to gain independence, symbolically and also to spice the British, <laughs> he chose the same location where he did his independence speech. Right. So the reason we have the monument built on this particular location. Now he was from the western part of Ghana, a town called Nkrofo, born on 21st September 1909. And since 2009, his birth date has been part of our national public holidays. The Memorial Day for him had his early education around his hometown I was trained as a teacher in Accra, a school we call Achimote School. He completed, taught for a while, but whilst teaching, he met a Nigerian called Namdi Azikwe, who had studied also in the US. So he advised Nkrumah, he taught Nkrumah was also smart, so he had to study abroad. So he recommended Nkrumah to go to Lincoln University, HBCU, for his undergrad, which Nkrumah did and got admitted on a scholarship. So he read economics, sociology, and theology. And whilst a student at Lincoln, he was an active member of a fraternity. He belonged to Phi Beta Sigma fraternity at Lincoln University. So from Lincoln, University of Pennsylvania, where he had his master's degree, he read education and philosophy. After you went back to Lincoln to teach in African history and languages, and even in the early part of 1945, he was also voted Professor of the Year at Lincoln University. <coughs> but in late 1945, he left US altogether for his PhD in England, so London School of Economics. But whilst in England studying, he was someone who had earlier was very passionate on issues about civil rights, liberation struggle, and pan-Africanism. So whilst in England for his PhD, he got himself very involved and active in such activities. Around the same time, there was a movement formed back home to start a process towards independence. <coughs> and some of their leaders had gone to England for a program. Some way, somehow, they heard about Kwame Nkrumah, met him. So he was invited to return home and help the struggle towards independence. So that's why he returned home in 1945. He joined a group. They were called the United Gold Coast Convention. He became their general secretary. But a year and a half later, he left the group to form his own political party called CPP, which means Convention People's Party. He left the first group due to issues of ideology. 
he was very radical. So he was saying independence or self-government now. His friends were saying in the shortest possible time, or more or less later. So he left the group to form his own party called CPP. And in all his efforts at helping us gain independence, the colonial government actually sent him to jail twice. The second time he only went to jail because he had earlier declared what he called positive action. But at a point, he was organizing a series of protests against colonial administration for independence. So the last protest we sent him to jail was captioned, quote, we prefer self-government with danger to servitude in tranquility, end of quote. What he said got people very excited, so there was chaos all over town. So he was arrested. They charged him for what he called he organizing an illegal strike and also treason. So they sentenced him to serve a three-year jail term at James Fort Prison, which is just down the road here. But whilst he was also in jail, our people kept pressure on the colonial government so he could be released. That forced the British to organize elections to elect people into a kind of first local government. And luckily for Kwame Nkrumah, even though he was in jail, his name was allowed on the ballot by the colonial government. They did that more or less to keep people outside making noise still quiet. But that became a biggest mistake they did because election came and they actually won. So they were forced to release him prematurely. So he served one year, two months, instead of three years in jail. And he only got released because he got elected. He came out, became leader of government business, worked with the British until the eve of 6 March 1957, when we gained independence. So he came right here. We have the spot where he did his speech. And then, at that time, Ghana was the first country south of the Sahara to gain independence from the British. So I would say the whole civil rights movement of the US moved to Ghana. Because somewhere in the crowd that night, was Martin Luther King Jr. He came to listen to him. In fact, it was after his experience in Ghana that he gave a Harvard Dream speech back in the state. To draw increment speech, he said, amongst other <coughs> things, that the independence of Ghana was meaningless unless it was linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. And that it was time to prove to the whole world that given the same opportunity, the black man was also capable of managing his own affairs, ready to make mistakes and also correct them. He actually inspired independence across Africa and even part of the Caribbean. Soon he became our prime minister and the queen of England remained our head of state. And the three years later, Ghana became republic before he got sworn in <coughs> as first president on July 1st, 1960. So he led us, did what he could for us. He was someone who had strong socialist views. So all his policies were influenced by that. So education, infrastructure, industries he pursued, and also a strong believer and a promoter of pan-Africanism. So after most countries on the continent had gained independence, he and some leaders helped to form our continental union, the then OAU, now the AU, which we celebrated just two days ago. But later, after they formed the Union, he and some leaders also felt that political unity alone for Africa was not enough. But it must also unite economically and especially protect African minerals and resources from continuous foreign exploitation. So they were saying things like, Africa is for only Africans. Now let's protect what we have. Because of that, at a point, US government restricted foreign aid to Ghana. That made him to look elsewhere for money and aid to build his country. That was in, in the early 60s. So he became closer to countries like Cuba, Castro, the Soviet Chairman Mao, and the Chinese Chairman Mao, and the Soviet Nikita Khrushchev. So eventually, the US government then branded him also a communist. So that led to foreign aid being restricted. <coughs> Unfortunately for Kwame Nkrumah, in 1966, his government was taken down in the first military and police coup d'etat in Ghana. The coup actually happened when he had taken a trip abroad. 
he was one of those who had earlier been appointed as mediators for the then Vietnamese war. So upon the request of the US government, he had to go on that trip. But the Egyptian intelligence warned him not to go on the trip. But for some reason, he took the trip. So whilst he was away, conveniently, some of his army generals staged an overthrow of his government. So obviously, he couldn't return home and got exiled to a country called Guinea, also in West Africa, where the Guinean government wholeheartedly accepted him and made him also the co-president of Guinea because he also helped Guinea for them to gain independence in 1958. That is why he lived until he fell sick in 71. They took him to Romania for medical treatment where he then died of prostate cancer. It's prostate cancer, we are told, in 72. So they embalmed his body in Romania and took him back to Guinea where he was given a state funeral and burial as co-president. But three months later, they transferred his body from Guinea back to his family home in Ghana because at the time he died, unfortunately, his mother was still alive. And he happened to be the mother's only child. So she requested they brought him back home. That was where he was and the Ghanaians thought he deserved a proper national memorial. So this whole monument was built up in 1990, but opened to the public in 1992. So when he finished here, transferred from his family home to a mausoleum where he's now rest, resting, at least for the third time since he passed. And also, in the spirit of promoting Pan-Africanism, he married an African. His wife was Egyptian. Her name was Fatia Nkrumah. Their union was politically arranged. It was an attempt to unite Arab Africa to some Saharan Africa. She died only in 2007, and they have three kids out of the union. But before the marriage, he had a son already from an earlier Ghanaian relationship. So they are all for all his kids are still alive. Two of them are also active politicians here, but in different political parties. His wife died only in 2007, back home in Egypt. And not long after she passed, the news came from the children that during her last day, she actually made a wish on her sickbed to be buried close to or next to her husband. Discussions went on then. It was agreed eventually. So they brought her back from Egypt, gave her also a state funeral. So she's also buried next to the husband in the mausoleum right there. And I should add that the overthrow of his government, even though it was locally staged, we eventually found out it was all foreign orchestrated and funded. That was after some of the files of the US CIA were later released in the early 80s. So the US was heavily involved in that for two obvious reasons. One, because he was a socialist and had made friends people like Fidel Castro of Cuba. But when he died, Castro came to his funeral. And Africans have a different view on Cuba. Cuba is a close ally and friend to the continent. In that, till today, it offers a lot of scholarships for students to study medicine and engineering Cuba till today. In fact, but for the presence of a lot of Cuban doctors we have in Ghana, the effect of COVID in Ghana would have been a bit devastating because they were much involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the fight against that in our facilities. Secondly, because Nkrumah had become the most influential and powerful African leader and one making Africans conscious of the fact that let's stay united and protect what we have. He was one of those who talked about the United States of Africa. So a common currency for Africa, common military command. So all everything has to do with the unity of Africa, what he really promoted. So, but that also made him the biggest threat. Had to be killed. And then they had to be overthrown and eventually killed. So that's the history of Kwame Nkrumah, I should say. Um, we have pictures of him. So, Romani, do you have the pictures here? So, some of the pictures we, had, we got. Like he. So, yeah. So, he with um, Chairman Mao. Yeah. So here with um, Chairman Mao of China. And the night 
he did his independent speech right here on this ground. And then the good old Patrice Lumumba, who was a prime minister of Congo, who got killed also because he was a socialist and was promoting also pan-Africanism with Kwame Nkrumah. And the US and the Bajan government used some of his own people. He was brutally murdered in Congo. And then, this is when he got released from jail after he got elected. And then, we have Nkrumah with the late Queen Elizabeth II. And we have the now King Charles. And also little kid. Then, and then he with his, his buddy, Fidel Castro. And then, he was a very good friend to JFK, so he with President Kennedy. In fact, in 1961, President Kennedy gifted him a Cadillac, which we still got on the park. Cadillac. And uh, we have a picture of him with um, Nixon. Again, on the independence. And then also, his, his so uh, have a zoom, use the zoom. W E B Du Bois. Yeah, no, and then I'm, I'm sure some of you may know that is his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie. This is when they were going to form the Continental Union for Africa, the OAU. So Ethiopia is the only country in Africa without a colonial master. The mm. Italians tried, but never succeeded. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. He was the Egyptian president who arranged his marriage. He's called Jamal Abdul Nasser. And then a picture of his thank you. Picture of his village from where he was born in the in the he was taken in the early 60s. <coughs> and then he were here he was in London for a program. And this is when he got exiled to Guinea Conakry and they made him co-president of Guinea and in fact but for his mother who was then alive the Guinean government wouldn't have released his body back to us because they said we rejected him and had become a Guinean citizen so they gave a strong condition to release his body that was that the Guinean government had to build a mausoleum to honor him that was built before his body was released to Ghana. So after he died, because he embalmed his body, he used to be on public display for close to 20 years. Yes. But when this memorial was built, finished and they had to bring him here, they then realized it was beginning to deteriorate. So transferred into a wooden casket. And buried. So we, have, we, we actually have the casket in which he was laid for 20 years. It's metallic. It's there. We got his desk he used as president. His student buried from Lincoln University. We got we have a plaque from Far Vida Sigma fraternity as an active member. Um, the dress he wore, the original dress he wore when he did his independence speech, we got. There's a picture of him. In 1961, Muhammad Ali came to Ghana. Got a picture of him in a museum also. And, and um, Malcolm X also came to Ghana. Uh, Maya Angelou visited. And, and others. The, um, George Padmore. And others. Yeah, he was. Important things. Um, but this is um, a conference, the first conference they organized for liberation fighters <coughs> from all of Africa. So it was at, at this stage that the West became, began to put their focus on him. Because he was so powerful, so influential, charismatic. And most leaders in Africa looked up to him then. And most countries after independent Africa were socialist governments. Which was the biggest threat to Western interest on the continent. Sorry. So the first time he addressed the UN General Assembly. In fact, when Lumumba was killed, he was the only leader in the world that criticized the UN and the US for ha what happened to Lumumba. He was so bold to speak to, to all the powers that be at the time. 
So that, that, that's yeah, that, when he got sworn in as president of Ghana. Let me see. Um, he would have done UN Secretary General. That's Doug Hammarskjöld. And the senior. And then he would have, would have done the, with the first president of Liberia. His call. His name was William Tubman. Liberia is also the uh, the another uh, uh, country that was set up with freed slaves from the U.S. Also, never had a colonial master, but they mm. were more or less from the free, free American slave. Owned. American owned. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. American owned. And here with Nikita Khrushchev yeah. of the Soviet Union, our yeah. enemy of the U.S. and a friend to Vladimir Putin. So definitely, he became a threat to them. And then he was the first elected female leader of the world, as is Harimau Bandaranaiki of Sri Lanka. Yeah. So they were part of the group of leaders or countries that are from the non aligned movement yeah. during the Cold War period. And, that's, that's it. and then here again with Heidi yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> So, as uh, my child said earlier, unfortunately, we should have been open this May, but the presidency thought that. Since we'll be having our Republic Day very soon, let's hold on. And then it will be a big publicity before it just open in the first of July. So the monument is gonna be open. Initially the park was open from morning 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. But after it's reopened, we're gonna be open from 10 or earlier, like nine o'clock, to nine o'clock in the evening. Because in the evening we're gonna have we have new installations of fountains. We are gonna have musical fountains playing with the whole lightning show, music um, display in the evening, just to make people come and enjoy the facility um, the when it's open. So a new experience for most people. And also we also have an additional museum gallery. We're gonna have um, digital, his audios and videos being played, for people to listen to him. Most people have not heard how he spoke. And one thing about him that most Ghanaians also loved when he was around was that most of our leaders are lead travel they come back and they lose their accent he never did he, he never lost his accent so it made it easier for him to relate and he came from a very humble background his father was um, a blacksmith the mother was a farmer but because he was a very smart kid that's how he was able to rise up through education so he came back and anywhere he went people related to him because they knew where he came from and he could easily relate and sp spoke most of our local languages. It was easier for him to relate to everybody. So the market women especially just loved him. The trade union congress was on his side because, and in most elections that were held then, his party would, would always win because he was the one there to speak to the issues and made people understand the reason why we need independence and also to build our own country by ourselves. And he said, we, could, we would make mistakes on the way, but we'll correct them as we go along. So he became, he was loved. But of course, at a point, he also had his own challenges. During his, at, at the point of his rule, attempts were made through Western orchestrations to assassinate him. But he survived three of them. So in a way, it made him a bit paranoid. So he passed a law, which led to arrest of some of his key political opponents. And through world orchestrated Western media influence, he was painted as becoming a dictator. Mm. So some people believed that and so justified why he had to be overthrown. But it was much it was after the right information came out in the early 80s that we actually regretted. For doing yes. what, because <laughs> most of the things we pride ourselves on as Ghanaians and as Africans are things he has done. Right. But yes. we are still yes. enjoying yes. Okay. I enjoyed your pre uh, no. presentation. Awesome. Wonderful. <laughs> yes, I, I was suggesting to him <coughs> that for money, yes. we could get out of the bus. I don't know if you are, are going to the art center, we could just take a walk by the street. A, we could get a, a good view by the okay, opposite the parliament and take a picture okay. of the if that's okay with the leader. Oh, yeah, absolutely, oh, brother. Okay. Okay. I'll put you on this. I'll okay. get us as much as we can get. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I enjoyed the presentation and learning about such a great man. I wanted to know 
I didn't see a picture of his mother and his wife, and I wanted to know how they influenced his diplomacy, his policy. No, we have a picture of his mother and his wife in the museum. It's not part of it. This is just a section. We have about 60 pictures mm. in the museum. So he, his wife was Arab looking. Why? Why? Oh. <laughs> okay. But the, the sad thing is that our brothers from North Africa, yeah, yeah, yeah. today, yeah. she was light skinned. Yeah, she was light skinned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Till today, don't want to be called Africans. Yeah. Right. So Egyptians, Algerians, yeah. Moroccans, Arabs. and Tunisians. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. the then Egyptian president Nasser thought yeah. otherwise. Yeah. So he did that deliberate act of the marriage yeah. to make them know we are part of it. So, so yeah. So diplomacy, yeah, so that also influences diplomacy. But unfortunately his wife spoke <laughs> French yeah. to both of them, but she was more or less made to learn English while he was out to learn French in a way just for them to be able to communicate. So his mother, yes, she was a very humble woman. She died when she was almost about 102 years old, his mother. She really lived longer after the son. So they had, in fact, because he was the mother's only child, she was so dear to him. So we had, where she lived, when the boy was in power, the estate, or the, the community in which he lived was named after him. So today, it's called the Nyaniba Estate. It's in Labon, somewhere in Accra, here. So she, they had really had an effect on him. And unfortunately for Kwame Nkrumah, his wife, I should say, I mentioned earlier that during a coup, Nkrumah, in fact, he, he took a trip alone, so the wife and kids were back home here. And luckily for them, the military guys allowed them to be flown back to Egypt. And, and for some security concerns that Kwame Nkrumah had, he never allowed his family to join him in Guinea. So she had to raise the kids by herself. So they got separated after his overthrow. Which was one of the reasons why the Guinean government thought that she deserved an honor from us. So that justified the reason why she had to be buried next to him because for her to raise three kids by herself, she did a lot. And through all that thing on his life, she was there for him. So we thought that she deserved an honor. So both of them played a key role, especially his mother, because she was she was so dear to the mother. And by that point, they were they claimed that that was not his mother and that was not his son. And he always said that's my mother. Regardless, some even say that Nkrumah was not a Ghanaian. But our constitution also says that you don't have to be born a Ghanaian to be a Ghanaian. So it all my dear friends in Liberia say he was a Liberian. Let's <laughs> <laughs> say he's African then. Yeah. Uh, everybody wanted yeah, Guti. He's born in Liberia. <laughs> yeah, but he's African. Yes. Let's say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, he's but he's still a Ghanaian. Ghanaian. He was a Ghanaian. <laughs> and and uh, cause you don't have to be born in Ghana to be a Ghanaian. Yeah. Either of your parents could come from Ghana to be a Ghanaian. If you if you were a foreigner and you were located here as a kid, you could yeah. become a Ghanaian. So all the, all those were distractions to make him yeah. popular. But later on, we realized that no, he is the greatest leader we have known as yes. for us and also for Africa. But in the year 2000, there was a poll on BBC and he was voted as the African of the millennium. Yeah. So Mandela was not close to him. Wow. Yes. Good, excellent, excellent. Yes. That's good stuff. And he was, Mandela was not close to him because his influence and impact was not what Mandela had. Yeah. So he was beyond us. So he, he's so powerful. But through the same Western propaganda, yeah. they try to kind of water down the influence of such people on the African continent and, now Africa and the black race also for us not to learn about them and not being spied up by what they did for us. So he always, he was a prolific writer also. He wrote 14 books. And when he did his PhD, in fact, he had a, a controversy with his PhD thesis, his dissertation. It was titled Mind and Thought in Primitive Society, a study in ethno philosophy. So he submitted his, his thesis for review, and his supervisor, who was obviously one of those people, requested him to make some changes to some of the details. He refused to do that because, based, he said, based on his research, those were the facts that had to be presented. So at the end, his doctorate became an honorary one, even though he wrote a thesis for it. So they refused to give him an official 
doctorate because of, he refused to make some changes to the details he had presented. So he became an honorary PhD. Right? So we still call him Osajifo Dr. Kwame. When he was called Osajifo, it was a title given to him by a woman, which means um, the great warrior. The great warrior. So we always call him Osajifo Dr. Kwame. So it's my pleasure meeting, okay? Uh, yes, um, on your slides, um, did he, was he part of or was, was he influenced, have any connection to Marcus Garvey? He was influenced by Marcus Garvey. Because yes. Marcus Garvey was big in the, in yes. the African yes. thing. Yes, but yes, I think they met somewhere online. Yeah, he, he met most of the civil rights leaders then. He was with all of them, and he had lived. So when during vacations in New York, he saw he actually was selling fish on the street of New York on vacation to survive. So he, he more he more like experienced, and in fact he used to be called his English name was Francis. It was name he was called Francis Emia and Chroma, but he dropped his English name after his experience in the U.S. because that way he realized black folks were treated. So he, did, he never thought, he thought he didn't need to carry an English name. He would have had his own local name. So he dropped his English name and called himself um, Kwame Nkrumah. So he, so he named his eldest son after him. He was called Francis Nkrumah. His eldest son is about 98 years old now. Yeah, he's still so right, yeah. All right, Any so. more questions? What was, his, what was his relationship with Malcolm X? Malcolm X? The young man thing. So they were all civil rights, mm -hmm. yes. So they were all more or less. You have to have the same belief and aspirations. Okay. Then, so they could relate to a lot of things together. So it was easier for them to do things. But there were also others. In fact, initially, Du Bois also had his own issues. But later on, had to correct some of them. Yes, so, yeah, nice. Du Bois in Kruma asked to come and live. He became a Ghanaian. And Kruma brought him here for a special project, which was called the Encyclopedia Africana, which was to tell, for, for us, most African stories and history are written by Europeans. Skewed. Skewed, yeah. So the intention of bringing Du Bois here was to tell critical African story the African way. So he came here for that particular project, but he passed on in the course of the project. And this opens July 1st? July 1st, yeah. Gosh, we gotta come back then. We have to be back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we could drive to the edge of the curb, get down, take some pictures, and then back on the, on the bus. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. That's that good. That'll work.